Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about technology, power, society, and what it means to be human in the age of information. We are your co-hosts, Dylan and Jess. And in this episode, we interviewed Dr. Cynthia Bennett about accessibility and designing for disability through justice-oriented design. Cynthia Bennett is a postdoctoral researcher at Carnegie Mellon University's Human Computer Interaction Institute. Her research focuses on the intersection of power, disability, design, and accessibility. Cynthia centers the lived experiences and creativity of people with disabilities as starting points for developing accessible and justice-oriented applications of technology. Cynthia is also a disabled scholar who is committed to raising participation of disabled people in academia and the tech industry. And for this episode, we wanted to give a special thanks and shout out to one of our previous guests on the show, Mary Morris, who introduced us to Cynthia and her work a little while ago. We are so excited to share this interview with Cynthia with all of you. So we're on the line today with Cynthia Bennett. Cynthia, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And so we're going to get started on this conversation. Uh, We're going to begin at the beginning, basically. And we're curious about your research and uh, maybe even before your research, what got started you down this research path in the first place? Yeah, thanks for asking. So I have an undergraduate degree in psychology and a lot of psychology students Grad school is just inevitable um, to get a license to practice or to do the research, uh, psychological research. Graduate school is necessary. So I started doing research as an undergrad, but I wasn't thinking about human computer interaction or technology or accessibility. I started thinking about um, HCI and accessibility when I got a job after my undergraduate degree. And I worked in a computer science department at the University of Washington specifically, and I was hired as a research assistant to help PhD students working in accessibility to run user studies for their graduate school projects. So I knew about accessibility from an end user perspective because I'm blind and I use accessibility features and access technologies all the time. And one of those technologies that I rely on is called a screen reader. And this kind of speaks out what is on a computer screen and screen reader users use keyboard commands and uh, touchscreen gestures, a more contemporary smartphone screen reader access uh, uses like accessible forms of gestures to enable touch interaction. And so um, I was helping to run a user study in this accessibility research lab, and I was asked to use an Android phone with the participants in the study. The phone had a prototype that I would you know, give the phone to a participant who came in to do the study and they would complete some tasks and then the study would be finished. And the participants in this study were blind. We were testing uh, an accessibility feature that a student had um, invented and testing its feasibility. And so I was blind as a researcher and the participants were blind and there was this bug in the app because, you know, it was a prototype. There was this bug where if somebody performed a gesture in a certain way, the whole phone would just shut down and we needed to power on the phone and like open up the app and start over, uh, start that particular trial over. And it was just something we knew happened. Well, unfortunately at the time, this particular Android phone, uh, the screen reader setting could not actually be turned on by a blind person. And so when the phone powered back on after crashing, the screen reader on the phone was not on and I could not actually resume running the study with that participant unless I left the user study lab, 
ran around the building and found a sighted person who could turn the screen reader on for me. And then I would go back to the study room and finish running the study. And so this was kind of funny. Um, like, it was just funny kind of sometimes running around, like poking my head in the office and be like, hey, can you turn on the screen reader on this phone? I'm running a study. Um, but it started to get me thinking about what, what are the ways that we think about accessibility and who do we expect to need accessibility features? And I started to think more deeply about this when I was reading other research papers and paying attention to research projects. And I started to realize that a lot of our focus in accessibility and disability and technology assumes that an end user is a person who needs accessibility features. But I was a researcher. I needed to be able to run studies. I needed to be able to analyze data. Um, and so in this context, I was not only an end user, but I was also a researcher and a designer. And so that's kind of set me on this path to nuance accessibility research to think about what are the ways that technology and our design and research processes, uh, how do they like figure disability as a life experience? Like who do we expect to have disabilities? And so I've spent a lot of my career doing projects that challenge existing design and research processes and trying to kind of recover them by starting with the actual experiences of disabled people and our creative practices to say, no, there's actually other ways of doing design um, that assume that, you know, maybe participants have disabilities, but maybe designers, maybe developers or professors have disabilities too. We need to make sure this whole pipeline is accessible. So. Sorry, that was a long story, but it's, it's very, it's a very poignant moment um, near the beginning of my career that just got me to think, I think a little bit differently than the dominant focus of accessibility research. Yeah, well, it's also, it's a great segue into one of the projects that you have been working on for a while now, um, which is titled Biographical prototypes and it centers storytelling and firsthand accounts. And so could you start by just telling us what this project is? Yeah, thanks for that introduction. So with biographical prototypes, we uh, try to position storytelling as a design method for fostering listening by designers uh, to disabled people and kind of positioning disabled people as the the fashioners of their own lived experiences and the designers in their own lives. And this activity, the way we ran it, is done kind of in a design workshop. And so, uh, you know, there's, there's different types of interventions. And this one is kind of like, well, we know that professional design will continue to exist and the design workshop uh, or group activities are very common and well-loved ways of designing and gathering feedback. And so can we kind of appropriate that popular gathering or method and instead kind of turn the tables a little bit and say, okay, well, instead of professional designers being in charge, let's have um, disabled folks come in and use like the traditional art and design supplies to recount their own stories of designing things in their own life. Um, so this project was, launched by another aha moment I had in my career. So a long time ago, I started to realize like hmm, accessibility research tends to assume that only end users have disabilities. And I know that's not true because I am a disabled researcher and designer. And so, but sometimes things take years to grow and you need the language or you need examples for things to click into place. And so in 2018, I read an opinion piece in the New York Times called We Are the Original Life Hackers. And this disabled design activist named Liz Jackson interviewed someone named Betsy Farber. Um, Betsy Farber was married to someone named Sam Farber, and together they and some other people owned OXO Good Grips, which is a popular brand of kitchen tools. Many of us, including myself, probably have OXO Good Grips tools in our kitchens, and the tools are marketed to be comfortable to use. They're very well known. And as a, uh, an academic, I had attended a lot of lectures on universal design 
that make an argument that if we think about accessibility for people with disabilities, everybody benefits. And OXO Good Grips was given as an example. So OXO Good Grips company has this story online that says, oh, this person named Sam Barber noticed that his wife Betsy had arthritis, and so he designed kitchen tools that were more comfortable for her. And so this story was peddled as an argument like, a, hey, if you design for disability, then you might be able to build this incredible brand of products that everybody loves. And I don't disagree with that, but when Liz Jackson, the author of this We Are the Original Life Hackers article, interviewed Betsy, she revealed a different perspective on that story that had not, to my knowledge, been widespread knowledge. So Betsy um, talked about how she actually had hacked up several prototypes for these kitchen tools just in her own life. Like she was experiencing discomfort trying to use kitchen shears um, and also trying to open jars. And so she actually was like taping stuff together and hacking stuff up together in her own home. And that creativity is not is not available. It was not widespread. Um, and so what you kind of have more commonly are these like savior narratives where someone who is assumed to be non-disabled has this wonderful idea to develop a technology that saves a disabled person from some discomfort or barrier that they have. And often those stories, from what I've learned, like uh, from this interview with Betsy Farber and then during the Biographical Prototypes projects, a lot of these savior narratives leave out the fact that disabled people have been designing in their own lives and coming up with their own hacks. And so that's where I, I read this story and I was like, oh my God, I have been to these universal design lectures. I have been telling this OXO Good Grip story and I haven't been uplifting Betsy Farber uh, for her contributions uh, that were very much informed by her experience uh, having arthritis. So uh, we designed, the team I worked with designed these workshops to be able to position disabled people coming into design situations, you know, whether they're researchers or designers like me or anyone from the public just coming in and Starting off with the assumption that you have stories, you have probably tried to solve all the access barriers in your life, and maybe you have some cool solutions that work great for you. Maybe there is things that are still problematic, and as designers, we could help like amplify that or provide resources um, or something like that. But it, it's a very different from what I perceive as the predominant like paradigm that as a designer or technologist, I need to come in and save um, somebody with that's you know, neglects all the work that they've done. So that's a little bit of information about that project. Yeah, would you mind saying a bit more about the biographical prototypes themselves and then especially how they can be applied in a design context? Because sometimes design can be so much about like what that output is and like how do we do things that are not necessarily storytelling. And so I'm curious about how the storytelling can possibly help designers who are more product focused. Yeah, so I see multiple possibilities. And in sharing these, I'll also share a lesson that we learned and something maybe that I would do differently in the future. So I first think at the very least, biographical prototypes or storytelling are a great way to get to know someone with the premise that you know, you have stories, you have things to share with us, and we actually need to be listeners and learners. And so I think that's just a, like a courteous way to get to know someone. Um, but what I think can also happen is um, if you go into a design encounter, you know, maybe you are product focused, but if you go in with solutions already decided upon, you might really miss uh, some pretty important things. So you might be assuming that something is a problem that's not actually a problem. You might have an idea for a solution and someone, you know, disabled people who have that access barrier may have better ideas. And so I also think biographical prototypes are a great way to figure out like what is actually a problem um, and what 
you know, what types of solutions have people already come up with? And in, in a lot of cases, I think this can direct projects toward solving problems that are actually problems, not ass assumed problems. And also um, kind of amplifying existing solutions um, rather than kind of reinventing the wheel um, that might not be necessary. And this can open up opportunities for, I think, stronger partnerships and greater recognition of disabled people's contributions. So if it's more about, okay, like, how can we actually bring you on as a partner? And if you have a life hack that works really great and might help other disabled people with similar barriers, can we use our power as a design firm or as a company to help you amplify um, that solution and make it more widespread to people who need it? Um, so those are some ways that I see it applying in, in the real world in design studios. One lesson that we learned was some of the participants were, well, they were all excited and we, me included, we were all excited to learn from each other. It was, it was just a wonderful time to be like, wow, like how creative. Um, that's awesome that you came up with that. And I even noticed some participants like getting ideas from each other. Um, and kind of deciding like, oh, I'll go home and try that for myself. So it also fostered like community building and just skill sharing among people at the workshop. So it wasn't all this like top down designer uh, in charge. It was actually kind of cool to see people make connections and give each other ideas. Um, but the caveat was that some people were rightfully so frustrated that in celebrating their life hacks and creativity, we neglected acknowledging um, as much as we should have, we neglected acknowledging ableism, like the structural ableism that necessitates these life hacks. So if the world was an accessible place, and if we prioritized accessibility for people with disabilities, a lot of these life hacks would not be necessary. And so there was kind of this desire for nuance that like, yes, we want to be recognized and we want to celebrate our creativity, but we also need you as designers to understand that this is because of structural ableism and you should not just be celebrating our successes, but also like recognizing that this celebration comes from pain and we need structural accessibility to be fixed. So I think if I run these in future, I would definitely spend time kind of honoring more disability history and activism and recognizing that ableism is still very much part of our structure and kind of holding that in the same space along with that that celebration. Definitely. And, and something else that you and um, your authors mentioned in the paper was this tension between recognition and obligation. And this is something that I think both Dylan and I spoke with you in, in a previous meeting before Cynthia about, which was uh, this like weird balancing act that needs to happen where um, in order to design for accessibility and to not erase the voices of the people who these designs are being made for, we, we need to bring in people with disabilities and we need to have more diverse design teams. But on that same thought, we also don't want to uh, ask that disabled people be responsible entirely for designing a world that is accessible. And so how do you balance that own tension in your work, bringing people in without uh, exploiting the labor and requiring that all the work that has to be done is, is from people who are a part of the disabled community? Yeah, this is a great question, and I don't think I have struck a balance at all. Um, it's something I'm thinking about, and so I'll just talk about some things that come to mind. I've been thinking about design pedagogy and user, um, like HCI pedagogy, that kind of says, like, okay, well, you shouldn't design for yourself. And I think about the ways that that assumes that the person sitting in that course is of like a privileged static identity. And so I wanna think a little bit more how we can um, kind of introduce pedagogy and methods that teach more about like, we all bring something to design encounters and what might be helpful is really reflecting on like, 
what am I bringing? What is appropriate to bring? What, like, what do, in what ways do I need to step back? And the reason I mentioned this, it is a popular, you know, topic. There's a lot about reflection and, and reflexivity in engineering education that I see, but I don't think we've talked about a consequence that I've seen is um, when we don't have an expectation that everyone is designing for accessibility, um, all of a sudden the few disabled folks who make it into tech or design are kind of expected to design for accessibility and if we want to do other things or if we actually don't have an, an expertise like maybe a different disability or a different access barrier like we're not automatically just qualified uh, to design for that um, so that didn't answer your question but I think part of that answer again kind of addressing the whole pipeline is you know having greater expectations that designing for accessibility is a non-negotiable part of just being an ethical and good designer and we all you know try to design for ourselves in some cases that can be really radical like a disabled person designing something that works for them because many many other products have not worked for them um, and in some ways that can also be inappropriate and even sometimes that could be disabled people like making uh, design decisions that can hurt other people because they're only thinking of their own access needs so that's kind of one thing i'm thinking about um, another thing I'm thinking about is um, also how I need to lead by example. And so I am disabled and I try to make it clear when I can that I need um, allies and non-disabled folks to step up, particularly in work settings where accessibility is not a common practice and to take on some of that labor. Um, but there are ways that I have privilege and I need to do better by my colleagues, um, you know, as a white person and a cis woman. So I'm also thinking about how, how can I take more responsibility? And I think sometimes that has led to um, some cross solidarity conversations um, where, you know, maybe colleagues or other people notice that maybe I'm starting to take up other perspectives and other commitments in my work that aren't just about accessibility, but maybe about, um, you know, racial justice or gender justice. And obviously, I am not the judge of whether I'm doing this correctly or well, but just to say that I also think part of it is me looking inward to myself and trying to be an example of what it means to take into account things that don't particularly affect me because I am in a position of privilege, but do uh, greatly affect other people. I have a follow-up that may be an impossible question, actually, but um, just to just to pose it, because um, you're talking about this like complex system, and when we're talking about design or research, we're talking about like these multi-stakeholder spaces or these in intersectionalities that we each carry and that we carry on our teams. And and I'm wondering, I guess how how can we have like metrics of success in those spaces like for you when, when you're doing the research that you're doing how do you think about like what successful um design can look like yeah that's a tough one um i i tend to look at who is amplifying the work and you know, when a lot of my disabled friends and colleagues are amplifying something, I do trust it a little bit more. So I think like a metric of success is like, is the community voluntarily engaged and enthusiastic about the work? Um, a couple of other ways I pitch this, um, and these aren't always like 100%, but so some things I look for, like if I'm trying to assess whether someone is a safe person or not, I look for signs like, do they have disabled friends who like voluntarily hang out with them? Um, do they have disabled people in their life who are in the same or a higher position of power? Like, do they have experience working for a disabled person being like asked to do things by a disabled person? Um, so those are, I think are, um, in terms of like when I look for people like who to who to collaborate with, 
Um, I look for those types of experiences. And then for thinking about like whether a design project is successful, I kind of look for the like, is the community voluntarily engaging and amplifying this work? Um, and, you know, if they're not, there's a sign that maybe the project was more about, you know, a particular designer goal or design goal um, rather than positively impacting a community or it could speak to something about a power imbalance where that community didn't feel very heard. Um, but yeah, again, these are just hard questions to answer because often our institutes, whether it's tech companies or academia are just set up not in service of people. Uh, so it can feel a little bit like, um, you know, a shot in the dark, but it, sometimes you kind of scaling back, thinking about um, what might be a metric of success for a project is like, can I influence, you know, something, can I bring a different perspective to a meeting and am I able to change a design decision by bringing that perspective you know in some cases that will be your metric of success if that's the power that you have um so that it can look like very different things depending on the situation and as we talk about perspectives and bringing more perspectives into this design conversation uh, a lot of people tend to use perspective and representation synonymously and so there's a big conversation right now in the tech industry about finding that representation um, in design but then also in uh, just the creation and deployment of these technologies and you've actually done some work recently on representation not necessarily in the design room but actually for end users and uh, we just discovered recently that uh, your paper at CHI 2021, that's the uh, Human Computer Interaction Conference, got an honorable mention. It's titled, uh, quote, It's Complicated, Negotiating Accessibility and Misrepresentation in Image Descriptions of Race, Gender, and Disability. Could you tell us a little bit about the study that you did for this paper and some of your findings? Yeah, thanks for introducing the project. Um, so I always say that a lot of my projects that I do are because I got angry. <laughs> and this was like no exception. Um, so it was around like the summer of 2019. And I had been really fortunate to get to know some of the gender and AI researchers like Morgan Schurman and Oz Keys. And learning, like just being a learner and realizing, okay, people are being misclassified by AI systems. These misclassifications are replicating existing bias. So in the case of gender, classification systems tend to have two binary genders and completely no room for anyone who's a different gender or a transgender. Uh, these were doing real harm and so learning from these other scholars and also you know watching media coverage of like increasing amounts of racial injustice and immigration injustice and the the types of surveillance that were happening and the way that machine learning and ai was powering that um, unjust surveillance um i was just kind of taking all of this in so meanwhile, uh, around this same time is I'm an accessibility researcher and I'm always, you know, hearing about what's the newest thing and applying machine learning to solve accessibility barriers is a really promising avenue because often this can reduce the burden of developers or content creators of making every single thing accessible and accessibility might be able to scale if it can be automated and particularly by using machine learning. So I was hearing these two different tales and they didn't seem to be talking to each other. Um, I was hearing that AI was biased and perpetuating, perpetuating surveillance and misclassification of axes of like race and gender. And then I was hearing that it could be this really promising accessibility solution. And I was just started to get really frustrated um, there began to be some workshops on AI fairness and people with disabilities, and I'm really grateful that these conversations have 
have amplified and grown, but I haven't seen as much of a justice perspective. So um, yes, there's research on how disabled folks can be misclassified by AI, um, how AI surveillance can really like do terrible things for disabled folks. We've seen some of the media around like the COVID-19 pandemic and medical triaging resources away from disabled people um, because you know, machine learning builds on societal kind of assumptions that disabled lives are not as valuable. Um, but I hadn't seen like as much focus on, okay, well, if AI can help remediate accessibility barriers, what about these problematic surveillance? How is that gonna show up in these accessibility solutions? And does that mean we should be cautious? And I just, I wasn't hearing anyone make an argument about like the necessary ethics from like a disability specific perspective. So anyway, I just kind of, the anger kind of grew over time. I felt like these conversations weren't happening. And so I endeavored, like, I was like, well, um, you know, I'm gonna get a group of, of disabled folks and they're also going to be minoritized races and genders. And I wanna know what does it mean when you're at the nexus, when you could very much benefit by machine learning applied to relieve an access barrier, but when you're also one of one or more of the identities that are like known to be harmed by AI. So the way that this manifested specifically was in image description. So blind folks, like we can't see images, so we rely on textual image descriptions. And again, like a lot of people don't write image descriptions, please write image descriptions. They are human written image descriptions are way, way better than automatic ones, but automatically generated or AI generated image descriptions are proliferating. They can provide some information about an image. It's better than none. Um, and so I wanted to, to think about like, okay, well, is it okay if, uh, you know, a lot of times things like race and gender uh, and disability, like clues us into someone's appearance can add context or detail to an image description. And I wanted to know like what, what are the ethics around machine learning making these judgments and communicating, you know, perceived race, gender, or disability classifications of people and images to blind people? And like, what are the consequences if this is wrong? Like if someone is uh, given an image description um, of, of a gender and the person in the photo is actually a different gender, like what's, what's going on there? So, um, we gathered a team of, you know, people who have expertise in accessibility, machine learning, um, social media access, uh, race, critical race theory, and gender justice. And uh, we interviewed 25 blind people, and they were all, um, they had to be blind, and they also had to either be a Black, Indigenous, or person of color, or they had to be um, not cisgender, so either non-binary or transgender, or um, some other gender that was different from the one they were assigned at birth. And so we asked them about, like, their social media use and image description experiences, and we asked them how, like, how they had been misrepresented. Um, both in image descriptions of, of images of themselves and also just in the general public. We wanted to understand the impact of misrepresentation on our participants and we wanted to understand in what context do you think it would be very valuable or in what context do you want to know like race or gender or disability information about people that you encounter. And so the paper kind of talks about um, the different, like the different impacts of misgendering and um, mislabels of race on our participants. And it talks about particular contexts when our blind participants really, really would like to know this information. And it, the paper also talks about their thoughts on AI describing race and gender. Um, so kind of just in summary, like our, our participants were, had different, uh, impacts. Some of them were very, very harmed by being misgendered and uh, their race being misclassified. Others had experiences where it wasn't a big deal. Um, but in taking up kind of a justice lens, you know, just because it doesn't harm everyone doesn't mean that that doesn't poise us as technologists to act. Um, so we kind of ultimately kind of caution 
the the use of, of AI to describe appearance of people in image descriptions because of the potential harm. Like we know that gender and race are misclassified. We also know that disability research on how disability is classified like is not even really done to a level that we know um, what those classifications or misclassifications would be. And so kind of cautioning that image descriptions that are automated should not, you know, be describing this according to the potential harm that it could have um, based on our participant experiences. Um, but we also talked about how, you know, in the case of human written image descriptions, there are contexts where this information is really, really helpful and important. And so, um, you know, a lot of people wanted to understand the appearance, um, like, you know, race and gender presentation of people to understand representation in the media. They wanted to know, like, you know, reading conversations about lack of diversity in the media, a lot of our blind participants felt that they were assumed to be able to see um, and to know this information and they needed more image descriptions. Um, another one was, um, understanding where people are coming from when they're talking about identity. So on social media, this was a big problem where there would be a discussion where maybe someone would say, you know, only black people can comment on this status and blind participants feeling like they really couldn't uh, participate in or moderate these types of discussions because they couldn't make a judgment about whether someone commenting was doing so uh, appropriately, like whether they were a black person um, commenting or a person of a different race kind of stepping outside their lane. So there was a lot of hesitancy to engage in these conversations um, in these, particularly these protected uh, spaces on social media meant to kind of foster these types of conversations on race and gender justice. Um, so there's a few other contexts in the paper, but just kind of revealing a lot of tensions and questions around like there need to be more image descriptions that convey appearance information about identity characteristics that we that we care about. Um, you know, in certain conversations, race and gender and disability really do matter. And our blind participants did not feel like they were getting access to this information to the degree that they needed to to be um, aware and conversant on kind of culturally relevant and culturally like contemporary um, understandings of race, gender, and disability. And then I think the final thing I'll point out is there was a big difference between um, preferences for how image descriptions are composed uh, as to whether someone is known or not. So it's kind of across the board perceived absolutely inappropriate to assume someone's gender or race or disabilities um, but just by looking at a photo. And so this kind of aligned with our recommendation that you know AI shouldn't be assuming this information either if it can't, if uh, someone can't confirm uh, what the description will say about themselves. And so um, kind of asking image describers to be really thoughtful and to maybe use, um, you know, writing more details about the person's clothing or hairstyle um, or, you know, maybe describing access technologies, like if someone is holding a cane or has a service animal and you can, you know, tell that it's a service animal, maybe saying those literal physical features of the image without like interpreting that up a level and saying, oh, a blind person or a woman or a man. In the case of race specifically, there's a lot of, um, efforts like to maybe describe skin tone as like a substitute for race, but our participants also kind of brought up concerns of colorism and particularly the ways like skin is usually described like using lighter or darker language. And um, so we kind of pose that as a question in the paper that in particular how to describe um, appearance without assuming race and without using um, maybe colorist or offensive language is still kind of a question that's, that's was really left open at the end of our paper that we didn't feel super confident to make like a rigid recommendation. Um, so that's that's just a, kind of a summary, but I think the takeaway for me, what I try to tell um, folks, accessibility AI researchers is these people had, had perspective. There are people who live at the intersections and could possibly benefit from AI for accessibility, but they did not universally want it if it could do harm. And that I think is a message that I hope 
can amplify just recognizing that people are complicated um, just because something might help them with an access need does not mean that they don't care that it could possibly do harm. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't care that it could possibly do harm. In fact, I think it means we need to like run toward that. And, um, you know, people living at these intersections of, of identities in this case, again, where they can really benefit by having large amounts of image descriptions produced by AI, um, thinking about the best way to compose um, those image descriptions or do, um, do it in a way that, that gives people more agency to opt in or opt out or to declare like how they can be described um, or when you know they they opt into being analyzed for image descriptions by AI. So I just I think yeah it was it was kind of the, the takeaway that, that I hope is just understanding that these conversations are more nuanced than like, oh, accessibility, we can make it better. Okay, fine, let's just do it and not think about the other ethics. Well, obviously, we're a big fan of your work. We're also a big fan of the some of the collaborators uh, that you've mentioned. You know, we've had Morgan on the show and and Oski's on the show, um, and also we got connected through you or to you through through Mary Morris. Um, and some of the th- topics that we've talked to them about have been about this justice perspective. Um, that you've mentioned. And I'm curious about, from your perspective, how, like, whether you're an industry or academia doing research, how would you recommend to folks that you do that well, that you bring in a justice perspective um, in a way that's both, you know, sensitive and effective and uh, ethical? Yeah, thanks for asking. This is a hard question. I think the first thing I am trying to remember myself is that I can read and go to events and I can try to to be a justice oriented activist but when you are being paid by universities and companies you can't be the judge of whether you're doing this justice work well and so I think that's where uh, my first thing is setting up being in enough contact with people who are on the ground doing you know justice oriented organizing and who don't have like the bias of the the things that the universities and companies want out of us um to to be held accountable and uh, to be judging your work um and not that you're kind of the one that's like oh we did this justice oriented project and I, I am an academic and I determined it was justice oriented. No, I, I don't think I can actually be the determinant of that. Um, and then I guess the one thing we recommended in the image descriptions paper is um, in my thinking, a justice oriented per- perspective leaves open the option that we have to be willing to say no. Um, and toward that end, I proposed and in many others as well in kind of like restorative justice, I know is, is thinking about benefits and harms. And so really trusting that we we not only can learn about potential benefits of technology um, when we talk to people, but we can also learn about their experiences um, and how the technology may kind of perpetuate harm. And so even just bringing in that like nuance of a of a like analysis to your data or to your protocols um just even having conversations with people about how something might not be a good idea i think is is a small step in the right direction um particularly if you're in a situation where like you know doing totally community-based work is not something that you have the support to do um like i said even just in typical user study methods incorporating into your protocols thinking about the ways that technology can do harm and then another thing i think about and i learned specifically from disability justice is again kind of what i was mentioning earlier how um disabled folks sometimes were assumed to know everything about accessibility but actually um, people have conflicting needs, and this supersedes disability, but disability is an excellent example. And so kind of intentionally bringing people with very different needs and experiences, and so that you realize maybe what some of those conflicts might be, 
Um, and then you can kind of think about that uh, from maybe different ways that the design would need to be customized or maybe even different people need different solutions or maybe a solution isn't a good idea because it'll really help one group but cause like really, really you know bad conflict uh, for another. So just intentionally, um, a lot of times we separate user groups like based on a characteristic and I would actually encourage that to, to find those conflicts, um, bringing people together who have different experiences. Um, so those are just a couple tips. I don't know that they like really embody justice. As, as I mentioned, I'm not, I, I can't be the judge of that, but those are a couple of things that I'm thinking about trying to embrace more in my work is kind of running toward tensions and, and acknowledging the potential harms um, rather than just trying to like design more and more and more technology. Definitely. And Cynthia, for anybody listening to this who is interested in designing with that justice perspective or maybe utilizing some of the techniques that you have found some positive impact with through your own work, is there a best place for them to go to look at the work that you've done and to maybe get in contact with you? Yeah, um, so I am not the best at updating my website, but it is at uh, bennettc.com, so my last name, B-E-N-N-E-T-T-C as in Cynthia.com. But most of my work is on Twitter, uh, like I my recent updates. So that's at uh, CLB5590. And honestly, if you're interested in justice, the disability justice specifically, the first thing I would send you to, there's something called the Disability Justice Primer. It's published by a performance project called Sins Invalid. Um, just research the disability justice primer and it's like a how to guide like how to organize an activist event that's accessible for people with different disabilities and you can pull a lot of great tips out of that and, and just integrate some of those very, very quickly into your practice, a lot of like very grassroots um, methods so that would be my first uh, like a $5 handbook and you're supporting a great organization um, that does justice oriented performance work. So the disability justice primer would be my very first suggestion. <laughs> Definitely. And we will be sure to include that and all of the other amazing resources that you've shared with us throughout this interview in our show notes on our website. But for now, Cynthia, thank you so much for the work that you are doing in this space, the important work that you are doing. And thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk to us about all of this. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. We again want to thank Cynthia for joining us today and for this wonderful conversation. Jess, what do you think? <laughs> What do I think? I learned so much from this interview. And I know they, I say that about every single interview, but I really, really found the stories and especially the research projects that Cynthia has been working on incredibly compelling. And I think the last case study that she explained to us with her recent paper at Kai um, was probably one that's sticking in my head the most right now. And um, when she was explaining this specific part of the study that is sticking with me is when she was explaining how some of the participants in this study were saying that they really need AI-fueled image descriptions and that they are really helpful in a lot of circumstances, but until the point when they cause harm. And when I heard her say that, I was thinking in my head, it sort of feels like this catch-22. It's almost like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Like we need more image descriptions because people aren't providing them at the the rate that we need at this point. Uh, point in time. But if we are going to use AI fueled descriptions, there is harm to making inferences and assumptions about the the things and particularly the people and identities that are trying to be described. And so I'm, I'm stuck in that sticky tension um, between the do we implement it? Do we not implement it? What causes more harm? What causes less harm? And how do we even measure that harm in the first place? <laughs> Yeah, it, it struck me when Cynthia made that appeal to uh, listeners, which we also want to underline, um, to put those image captions on posts um, that you make. And and what that made me think of was, uh, you know, this concept of techno solutionism, which we talked about before in the show, this idea of like creating technology to fix 
problems because you know if we just keep making better technology then we can uh, you know solve more and more problems and it's just inevitable it's almost this like development narrative that you know we'll we'll get there eventually and i think what cynthia's research and work points to is that we have this very complex and nuanced social system including you know uh, bias against disabled folks and um, a design um, field that largely does not take into account the the needs of uh, that community and that population. Um, and so the question of how do we address those uh, social and, and societal um, issues while still, you know, utilizing technology, but maybe not making technology the, the focal point or maybe not even the starting point for how we, we address it. I mean, I agree with you. It does seem like a, a catch-22 because um, it seems like for, for Cynthia and, and at least my interpretation is that like there's almost a harm reduction model here of like we need to do something, um, but uh, the question of what we do needs a lot more nuance um, than saying, well, we need this to be more accessible, right? Like there are real needs of, of real people in this community and then, but then you have that whole thing of like, how do you, how do you do that development work while using that, uh, their expertise without saying, well, you need to do all of this, you know, uh, emotional or design labor um, to speak for like the entire disabled community or, or anything like that. So, I mean, I, I love Cynthia's work because it brings that level of complexity that I think is needed in these very nuanced and, and complex design spaces. Yeah, well, and that level of forethought too. I think that there's a lot of uh, intentionality in the way that um, the design projects are done um, with, with both Cynthia and her team and all the authors, the co-authors on these papers that she has um, published in this space. It's clear that there are a lot of stories and narratives that are being told from the people who are living and experiencing disability and experiencing the lack of accessibility in these technological systems. And I absolutely loved the project that Cynthia explained where they are, um, you know, representing the, the stories and the narratives and lived experiences of people who are needing accessibility in design. And it brought me back to um, one of the classes I've been taking this semester for my PhD program is called Community-Based Design. And one of the methods that we've been talking about um, for designing systems with people instead of for people is to bring in this element of storytelling and to stop making assumptions about what people need and what problems they're experiencing, but to actually ask them and to listen to them and to hear from them and work with them to first assess the problems and then design solutions or quote, you know, a solution space together. And I thought this was just such a perfect example of a way to do that without erasing the lived experiences of the people who these systems are actually supposed to be designed for and utilizing their expertise and their knowledge and their experience to make them better. It's almost like we've seen a, a renaissance um, in our fail, field, and maybe it's just like the, the circles that we run in jazz, but um, of uh, anthropology and sociology, but more specifically ethnography um, in in this research uh, world, in, in the technological research world, especially around responsible tech. Um, and it's, it's curious to me because it does seem like this centering of uh, people's lived experiences and, and lived stories. And what I love about uh, Cynthia's model of uh, biographical prototyping is looking like centering those stories, which I think is something that we can do no matter where we sit, no matter what we're, we're studying and, and researching. Um, because it seems like one of the things that's, that's gotten us into many of our, of our pickles, including that solutionist pickle uh, for lack of a better word, <laughs> the corners that we painted ourselves into, which are, you know, causing harm, especially causing unintended harm. Um, that the way out of that is to refocus on on the people, on the individual, on the the holistic individual, not just saying, okay, this person is this identity, so we need to do X, Y, and Z, like less prescriptive and more starting with that um, listening, right? Not not the move fast and break things mentality, but the how do we actually uh, listen to the people who are going to utilize this technology? And it might take a little bit longer to design for that, but in the end, the consequences are going to be much less dire um, and are going to create much less harm. Um, but, but again, we get to this point of like, well, the, is there still, you know, is there still going to be harm? Um, and 
you know, the answer is, is probably as we figure this out and maybe always like we're not, as we've talked about, you know, there isn't like this necessarily perfect system, but there is, there are systems that are much better than the ones that we're currently using. And Cynthia's, you know, uh, leading in how we might design those for this community and beyond. Absolutely. I think that's definitely a recurring theme in a lot of the episodes that we have on this show, too, is that we're not trying to to actually zero out harm. There's no way to completely mitigate harm. There are many ways to reduce harm, uh, especially in a lot of key areas and a lot of intersectionalities of identity and people who are experiencing the harms of these systems. And so we're hoping to, to you know, take some of our own advice here and, and continue to listen and hear the stories of people who are doing this work on the ground and making some incredible change for the tech community. Yeah, I think I just wanted to end with thinking about um, maybe our own, I don't know about you, Jess, but like the, this, this episode, um, along with, with Mary Morris's episode, really um, forced me, or invited me, I should say, to reflect on my own relationship with um, some of these uh, communities or, or terms or, or anything like that. And I know when we were, um, and by that I specifically mean around disability studies, um, and I know like when we recorded the intro and outro for Mary's episode, like I, I fumbled with my words a lot. And I think there's just like um, stigma that I was taught against, uh, you know, even disabled language say in, in high school where that was seen as like something I, sh- I shouldn't necessarily say or that it was like somehow derogatory or something as opposed to uh, descriptive or potentially empowering that um, it, I think it's really important for for each of us like and, and listeners to put ourselves in that uncomfortable space because I think without self-reflection especially of those of us who do have some design power here some real self-reflection about some of our own like social preconceptions um, about especially you know difficult or complex topics that that's another way that we're just going to fall into this unintended uh, but still you know the impact is still painful and harmful uh, harms um, so, that, so that's something that I'm definitely reflecting on and also like you know I, I am not I'm very guilty of not having image um, tags for images that I, that I put in image captions and so that's something that I want to commit to doing better after this interview. Yeah, I think it was actually maybe in Mary Morris's interview where she kind of opened my eyes a little bit to this this notion that it's not that the world is designed and structured for humanity and then there's people who are experiencing disability. It's that the world is designed to only be accessible to some and to be inaccessible to others. And we have put those structures in place. And so our language and our framing and our, our thoughts around what it even means to experience disability is largely, like you were saying, Dylan, stigmatized, but also it's built on this foundation of the structures that we have put into place. And it's also up to us to challenge those structures and to critique those structures and to hopefully build new structures where we can begin to recognize that it's actually possible to design for accessibility for everyone from the start. And I think after conversations with Mary and after this conversation with Cynthia, I'm starting to feel much more hopeful about a future where we have accessibility first design in our minds uh, from the get-go. And and I just, I really completely agree with you that I think I've learned a lot here and I think there's a lot more work to be done both individually and collectively as a community. And I look forward to seeing where it goes from here. For more information on today's show, please visit the episode page at radicalai.org. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Catch our new episodes every other week on Wednesdays. Join our conversation on Twitter at RadicalAIPod. And as always, stay radical. Radical.